Good afternoon. My name is Basilios Marinis, and I'm a professor of Christian art and architecture here at uh, Yale. It is my pleasure to uh, welcome you all in uh, today's lecture. And I'm also really pleased to introduce our speaker and uh, respondent today. Warren Woodfin is a specialist in the arts of Byzantium and its neighbors in the medieval world. His specific areas of interest include the ritual and ideological uses of objects and images, textiles and clothing, artistic agency, hierarchies of media, cross-cultural reception and appropriation of artistic motifs, and historical memory, amnesia, and reinvention in the Middle Ages. He is the author of The Embodied Icon, Liturgical Vestments and Sacramental Power in Byzantium, published by Oxford University Press in 2012, and a fine uh, study that uh, many of us have uh, used in our research, and also co-editor of Clothing, the Sacred Medieval Textiles as Fabric, Form, and Metaphor, published in 2017 with Mateusz Kapustka. He curated the exhibition From Desert to the City, the Journey of Late Antique Textiles at the Godwin Turnbach Museum at Queen's College, as well as the 2015 Metropolitan Museum installation, Liturgical Textiles of the Post-Byzantine World. His articles have appeared uh, in Dumbarton Oaks Papers, Gesta, Ars Orientalis, The Art Bulletin, and Byzantine and Modern Greek Studies, among other journals. Professor Woodfin earned his PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 2002, and his research has been supported by fellowships at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the University of Zurich, Dumbarton Oaks, and the Israel Institute for Advanced Studies. He has also been recipient of a collaborative research grant from the Getty Foundation to publish the finds from a 13th century nomadic burial in southern Ukraine, along with colleagues from uh, Ukraine and the United States. Concurrently, he's working on a monograph exploring the ways in which actual liturgy enacted by the Orthodox clergy interacted with artistic representations of the heavenly liturgy in the 11th to 15th centuries. <clears throat> Nina Glivetic works at the intersection of liturgical studies, medieval history, ritual theory, Byzantine studies, and Slavic studies. Born in the former Yugoslavia, Glibetic pursued religious studies at McGill University in Montreal before going on to graduate work in medieval theology at the Angelicum in Rome and liturgical studies at the Pontifical Oriental Institute. Her publications span a variety of topics, including the history of the Byzantine Eucharist, the history, the liturgy of early Slavs, medieval religious rites for women at childbirth and miscarriage, and the role and manipulation of liturgical memory in the formation of national identity. In addition to four co-edited volumes on Eastern Christian liturgy, Klibetic authored The Divine Liturgy of the South Slavs, A History in the Medieval Sources, which is uh, in press uh, and um, will be published in the Orientalia Christiana Analecta series. Prior to joining the University of Notre Dame as an assistant professor of liturgical studies and fellow of the Medieval Institute, Glibetic was a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, Dumbarton Oaks, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and the Institute of Sacred Music at Yale. And now I invite Professor Woodfin to begin his lecture. Thank you so much, Vasily. Let me share my screen. The Presbyterian Church of my childhood featured a large velvet curtain hung in its apse beyond the seats of the clergy and choir. The color of this curtain changed seasonally, and within an otherwise starkly white church devoid of images, it drew the eye as a focal point. Curious about this feature, I once asked the pastor what was behind the curtain. His one-word reply, God. At some point, I managed to find myself alone in the church, and I peeked behind the curtain. To my great disappointment, the curtain concealed only a blank wall. If faith is the belief in things unseen, according to the Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 11, 
Then textiles help to create the conditions for faith by dividing the things that are seen from those that are unseen, the sensible from the intelligible. The paradigmatic example of this division of the seen and unseen is the series of veils that divided the sacred precincts of the tabernacle of the Israelites and later the first and second temples in Jerusalem. The innermost veil, the one over the opening of the Holy of Holies, would never have been seen except by priests who served the temple. This veil was made of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and of finely spun linen, having on it a representation of the cherubim. These embroidered cherubim echo the sculpted beings that overshadowed the kaporet, or mercy seat, atop the Ark of the Covenant within. These are pictured by the artist of the 12th century homilies of James of Kokinabafos, as they flank the Ark with its tablets of the law, rod of Aaron, and urn of manna. Further screening the Holy of Holies from the people was a large outer curtain, which both in its composition and its decoration, as we are told by Josephus, symbolized the visible cosmos. Its component threads, scarlet, blue, and purple with fine linen, were interpreted as representing the four elements of fire, air, water, and earth. Its embroidered decoration, again, according to Josephus, represented the celestial bodies of the firmament of heaven. The textile thus not only symbolizes, but mimetically duplicates the created universe that conceals the invisible Godhead. The veil also helps to create a spatial model of the chronology of creation. God, creation's source, dwells amid the angelic beings in the realm of the intelligible and invisible, which, according to Philo, were the work of the first day of creation. The curtain that conceals the divine presence represents the first created visible elements of the universe, the works of the second through fourth days. A Jewish source from the second century BCE, the letter of Aristeas, mentions that this curtain continually billowed outward from the movement of air behind it, thus giving tangible form to the dynamic of an ongoing creation of matter out of the void within the Holy of Holies. The curtains of the sanctuary in Jerusalem give visible form to the boundary between the seen and unseen. Like a scrim, they allow the projection of invisible form of what is going on beneath, which would otherwise be invisible to the eye. The same paradox that the invisible world can only be comprehended by being veiled in the visible was also embraced in Byzantine theology. For the author of the Epistle to the Hebrews, the veil of the Holy of Holies provides the metaphor for Christ's assuming human flesh in Hebrews 10, a metaphor taken up by the author of the Protoevangelium of James, who assigns to the Virgin Mary the task of spinning the purple wool for the veil of the temple. Mary thus becomes the origin of both Jesus's physical body and his metaphorical body of the curtain. Just as the temple veil, or better, its heavenly prototype, provides the metaphor for Christ's appearance in the world clothed in flesh and blood, so the veils and curtains of the Byzantine rite clothe Christ's manifestation in the bread and wine of the Eucharist. According to the late Byzantine Archbishop and theologian Simeon of Thessaloniki, the church's earthly liturgy is in all respects identical to the heavenly liturgy, save that the latter is conducted without veils. This difference is no minor detail, as with the rites of the Jewish temple, veils form a central part of the aesthetic of the Byzantine liturgy. From at least the 11th century, a premium was placed on the hiddenness of the central act of consecration within the Eucharist. A letter from Nikitas the Chartophylax to Nikitas Stathatos discussing the meaning of the deacon's exclamation, the doors, the doors, let us attend in wisdom, argues that it cannot possibly be meant as an exhortation for worshipers standing outside the sanctuary to attend to the holy mysteries as these are hidden. I quote, it is risible to say that the deacons exclaiming, the doors, the doors, is to urge those standing outside the sanctuary to pay attention to the divine mysteries. For if they are mysteries, they are also completely hidden. 
and what reasonable man would urge someone outside to observe what has been hidden? For those things are mysteries that are now carried about, car sorry, carried out and accomplished by the priests in silence. In other places, I myself have also seen a curtain hanging about the holy bima at the time of the mysteries, being spread out to veil them so that not even the priests themselves are visible to those outside. This is what my Lord of Stathios, blessed among the patriarchs, did. But if the mind wishes to be uplifted in an anagogical manner, it will not be deprived of the spirit. In other words, that which the worshippers are being exhorted to pay attention to is the heavenly mystery, which they can access by anagogical contemplation through the gates of the intellect with the assistance of the Holy Spirit, and not the physical sacrament, which they cannot see. The early 12th century typicon of the monastery of Theotokos Kecharitomeni in Constantinople explicitly mentions curtains, pepla in Greek, hung in the four intercolumnar openings of the templon, presumably meaning two on each side of the central doors. Nikitas the Chartophylax mentions that he had seen this practice in other churches and that it was the usage of the late patriarch Estathios of Constantinople who reigned from 1019 to 1025, a generation prior. And in another letter, Nikita Stethatos affirms the general proposition that, quote, the comprehension and sight of these mysteries has been consecrated by God and his apostles solely to the priests who make the offering, as it is written. With the central act of consecration hidden from physical sight, the offertory procession known as the Great Entrance takes on an even greater role as the moment when the clergy and the Eucharistic gifts are made visible in the midst of the people. The bread and wine, set apart but not yet, con not yet transformed by the Eucharistic anaphora, anaphora sorry, are seen as symbols of Christ's crucified body, which will be transformed at the altar into his living, risen body. But even here, Veiling is essential. One of the veils of which Simeon speaks is the epitaphios, which he also terms ayir and epiplon, a large covering for the elements of bread and wine as they are ca carried in procession to the altar. According to Simeon, this textile represents at once the firmament of heaven and the burial shroud of Christ. Textile veils have been used to cover the Eucharistic offerings since the early Byzantine period. Witness the early example at Dumbarton Oaks of the asterisk used to prevent contact between the fabric and the particles of bread on the paten. We see the example here from the mid sixth century Sion treasure. The meaning of the epitaphios as firmament is suggested by the term ayir literally meaning air, as well as it's being carried over the heads of the clergy in a way that suggests the canopy of heaven. The decoration of sur surviving Byzantine epitaphii highlights the veil's other significance as a symbol of the burial shroud of Christ. This corresponds, of course, to the mystagogical interpretation of the great entrance as Christ's burial procession, when with the anaphora as representing Christ's resurrection. While in post-Byzantine Orthodox practice, the epitaphios is used exclusively for the rites of Holy Week, its original employment was in the regular round of Eucharistic liturgy. I take as my primary example for discussion here the epitaphios of Milutin Urosh, one of the earliest of preserved Byzantine epitaphii, which is also one of the most interesting from a liturgical standpoint. The unusual vertical orientation of the body has attracted comment, but so too has the dress of Christ. Instead of the usual loincloth to cover his nudity, there is what is unmistakably a representation of a veil. The visco kalima, or little air, used to cover the bread on the paten. The Belgrade Apitaphios is unmistakably liturgical in its function, which would originally have been to cover the gifts of bread and wine during the Great Entrance. The image on the textile thus uncovers a paradox that cross-references the realms of the pictorial and the sacramental. 
The covering of the Eucharistic offering by the figural epitaphios shows the bread to be the crucified body of Christ. While the fictive veil covering the image of Christ's body like the veil over the prospera itself shows him to be bread. The image of the dead body of Jesus showing the wounds in his hand and feet aligns with the Byzantine mystagogy of the liturgy that sees in this procession a symbolic reenactment of Christ's burial procession. At the same time, it speaks directly to the real, or rather anticipated, presence of Christ's body in the gifts as they are brought to the altar. Like the veils of the temple, the epitaphios simultaneously presents a liturgical now and an eschatological aspect that is both then and always. This connection back to the furnishings of the biblical temple is not merely fanciful. The potirokalima, or little ayer, from around the turn of the 14th century, now in the Bunaki Museum in Athens, shows Christ standing at a canopied altar, the setting is in heaven, as the numerous embroidered stars make clear. The pair of six-winged beings flanking the altar should remind us of the pair of cherubim flanking the Ark of the Covenant in the image we saw a few moments ago. The inscription around the border gives Christ's words of institution from the Last Supper, as transmitted by St. Paul, drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Christ holds in his hands not a chalice, but rather a vessel that resembles a vase with a globular body and two handles. Various explanations have been proposed for the appearance of non-chalice form vessels in the scenes of the communion of the apostles. In this instance, a typological resonance with the Ark of the Covenant and its contents seems to be the most salient symbolism. The vase held by Christ refers back to the urn or stamnos, of manna, contained within the Ark of the Covenant. Rather earlier than the development of the epitaphios, painted images of the melismos or Eucharistic, sorry, melismos, or Eucharistic fraction, whereby the 12th century already manipulating representations of liturgical veils and vessels to bring out the sense in which the Eucharist is a reenactment of Christ's passion, death, and resurrection. At St. George in Corbinovo, directly behind the actual altar, the apse fresco of the Melismos shows a fictive altar on which lies the young Christ Emmanuel. Like the Christ on the Belgrade Apitaphios, his loins are covered by a decorated ayer, or discocalima, and he is accompanied by the asterisk, the metal implement meant to keep the veil from physical contact with the bread. In different compositions of the Melismos, one sees sometimes the adult Christ, familiar from the Epitaphios, at other times the infant Christ. This presents another paradox, of course, as it is the mature, not the infant Christ, who suffered crucifixion and death in order to institute the Eucharist. But the same pictorial formulae are applied to both. This iconographic inconsistency may in part suggest an incomplete resolution within the mystagogical tradition. The language of sacrifice used in the prayers for the preparation of the bread and wine in the prothesis evokes Christ's passion, while the symbolic interpretation of this, the first portion of the service, treats it as a representation of Christ's infancy. This unresolved tension between the status of the amnos, the lamb or Eucharistic bread, as a symbol of the infant Christ and the great entrance and deposition of the gifts on the altar as symbols of his passion and burial is reflected also in the liturgical textiles themselves. While the canonical decoration of the epitaphios is the body of Christ after his crucifixion, the two little ayers, the potiro kalima and disco kalima, at times show the infant Christ. A 15th century discocalima from Kilandar Monastery excuse me
shows St. Basil, St. Basil and John Chrysostom, assisted by angels as they pronounce prayers over the infant Christ lying on a paten. On a Georgian chalice veil of the late 15th century, Christ Emmanuel is shown blessing from within an embroidered chalice. The surrounding inscription in Greek speaks both of his incarnation and of his sacrifice like a sheep, conflating the infancy and the passion. By depicting the figure of Christ emerging from a chalice on the veil that covers the chalice, its contents are revealed as the blood of Christ. But again, there is a paradox because the blood of the Eucharist is, of course, the blood shed by the adult Jesus in his passion. In a handful of fresco images, the infant Christ is seen as being dismembered by the painted holy clergy. Paradoxically, this is precisely the vision recorded as the unbearable sight inflicted in a variety of edifying tales, either on an unbelieving Jew who has happened to witness the divine liturgy, or on a wavering Christian believer who doubted the real presence. When, according to these legends, the recipient of the vision confessed the truth of Christianity, the vision was taken away and the likeness of ordinary bread restored to the prosphora. The paradox of the image of the melismos is that it purports to show the really real, but cannot, in fact, be taken literally as a theologically sanctioned view of the Eucharistic sacrifice. Again, it is not the adult Christ of the crucifixion that is seen, but an infant who, as we have discussed, cannot literally be the subject of the sacrifice. Nevertheless, it is the infant Christ, or the Christ Emmanuel type, that dominates the imagery embroidered on veils for the paten and chalice. I would like to suggest that the avoidance of direct correlation is somewhat deliberate. Like the asterisk, which keeps the veil from physically coming into contact with the Eucharistic bread, the imagery on the veils is carefully kept close to, but not identical to, what it conceals. These small slippages, as between the adult and infant Christ, avoid a potential collapse between the image and the Eucharistic reality it signifies. In contrast to the medieval Latin West, where the image of the man of sorrows became a widespread uh, embodiment of the Eucharistic sacrifice, Byzantium avoided the collapse of the symbol and its referent by keeping the liturgical symbolism from, from fully merging with the symbols of the passion. The exchanges between the young Christ and the Christ of the passion, as well as between iconographic markers of the liturgical context, veils, vessels, attendant angels, and a narrative context, mourners, cross, and tomb, always represent cross-references rather than the full merging of these two iconographies. The imagery on veils helps to sustain both the link and the difference between passion and liturgy. So far, we have been focused largely on the narrative symbolism of the Byzantine rite, what writers on the liturgy refer to as historia, the linking of moments of ritual action with events from the life of Christ and salvation history. There is another dimension, however, that particularly comes to the fore in the Paleologan period, which is referred to as theoria, the anagogical linking of the church's liturgy on earth with the eternal realities of heaven. We've caught glimpses of this mode of thought in the cosmic symbolism of veils we have already looked at the heavenly setting evoked by the seraphim and stars around the head of the dead Christ on the Belgrade Apitaphios, for instance, or the eternal tabernacle evoked by the Benaki Air. In early Byzantine art, this transcendent dimension of the liturgy is evoked by images such as the Maestas Domini, showing the heavenly glory of Christ, oh, sorry, heavenly glory of God, who is paradoxically also present on the throne of the altar. The foremost Byzantine writer for the anagogical approach to the liturgy, however, the Pseudo Dionysios, cautions us not to take these images literally, 
but only as metaphors for what cannot be apprehended by the senses. I quote, we cannot, as mad people do, profanely visualize these heavenly and godlike intelligences as actually having numerous feet and faces. They are not shaped to resemble the brutishness of oxen or to display the wildness of lions. They do not have the curved beak of the eagle or the wings and feathers of birds. We must not have pictures of flaming wheels whirling in the skies, of material thrones made ready to provide a reception for the deity, of multicolored horses or spear-carrying lieutenants, or any of those shapes handed on to us amid all the variety of the revealing symbols of scripture. Therefore, when images give artistic form to these scriptural metaphors that describe the invisible world of the angelic beings, the world invoked in the language of liturgical prayers, they maintain an implied dissimilarity to what they signify. And it is precisely this dissimilarity that prevents confusion between the represented symbol and the reality that lies behind it. That at least is Cyril Dionysius' theory, that images that are transparently unlike what they purport to represent are less likely to be mistaken for reality by the weakness of human intellect. We cannot, of course, be sure that every Byzantine viewer was so discerning as to know not to take literally the four-faced representation of the cherubim, for example, but the use of dissimilar images was at least some safeguard against confusing the symbol for its referent. Something very different happens, however, when the image of the communion of the apostles is substituted for the Maestos Domini in the apse of a Byzantine church. Rather than an image based on the metaphorical language of the liturgy, we have an image based on the liturgical ritual. Rather than translating from verbal metaphor to painted surface, the author is transplanting readily, or the artist rather, is transplanting readily visible ritual practice from human liturgy to the represented heavenly sphere. The nature of representation changes in this respect as the artist is interpreting something already visible, the ritual, in paint or mosaic, rather than rendering something previously invisible. Rather than revealing the heavenly in breaking through the liturgy as difference, it is treated as resemblance. If the Maestas Domini image is presented as something like pulling back the curtain on an awe-inspiring world of heavenly creatures that roar and bellow and cry aloud around the throne of God, the communion of the apostles is more like cracking open a Russian Matryoshka doll. The general appearance remains the same, although the protagonists change as one goes from the outer surface to the interior. Thus, the iconography stresses the sameness rather than the difference of the liturgy on earth and the liturgy of heaven. This similarity is magnified in the late Byzantine iconography known as the celestial liturgy. A developed example can be seen in the frescoes surrounding the central bust of Christ Pantocrator in the dome of Gracianitsa Monastery from about 1321. A procession of angels resembling the great entrance, the procession that brings the bread and wine to the altar in the Byzantine rite, proceeds from a canopied altar at the west side of the dome towards a second altar at its east side. The angels wear vestments that identify them with Byzantine deacons, and they carry veiled patens and veiled chalices. Around that second represented altar, a throng of adoring, adoring angels of various ranks bow toward the infant figure of Christ who lies on the altar, himself partly covered, like the vessels borne by the angels, with an embroidered veil. Ironically, given Simeon of Thessaloniki's assertion that veils and symbols are absent from the liturgy of heaven, here they appear in striking abundance. From an art historical point of view, the models for the Gracianitsa frescoes and similar images of the celestial liturgy are the clergy, whose observed ritual actions would have been familiar to artist and patron alike. But from the point of view of Byzantine theology, at least as articulated by Simeon of Thessaloniki, the heavenly liturgy is the model for the actions of the clergy on earth. Thus, Manuel Felice, in a poem on the heavenly powers, 
describes a dome decorated with angelic orders. To the king of all, the enthroned God, the angelic orders offer this liturgy so that every priest can be taught by this how to offer him a faultless liturgy. Thus, the really real model of both the fresco of the celestial liturgy and of the earthly liturgy that it resembles is the invisible liturgy of heaven. Vasilios Marinis has raised the question of whether the Byzantines really believed in a heavenly liturgy or whether the imagery of church rites carried out in heaven was rather a tool of visual exegesis and was never intended to be taken literally. Clearly, exegetical images, as distinct from straightforward iconic representations, did exist in Byzantine art, even though they are hardly acknowledged as such in the textual tradition. Marinis justifiably points out that when the liturgical commentaries discuss the worship of the angels in heaven, they refer to an immaterial worship without a sacrifice of bread and wine. Nevertheless, the way Byzantine writers refer to this heavenly worship strongly evokes the hierarchies and ceremonies of the Byzantine liturgy. Nikita Stethatos posits a precise correlation between the ranks of angelic beings and the clergy of the Orthodox Church. Quote, two hierarchies, one of the powers above in the heavens and the other below, our own ecclesiastical hierarchy upon earth. Close quote. Each of these consists of three triads, the uppermost consisting of the thrones, cherubim, and seraphim, corresponding to the patriarchs, metropolitans, and archbishops. The second, the dominions, virtues, and powers, corresponding to bishops, priests, and deacons. And finally, the principalities, archangels, and angels, corresponding to subdeacons, readers, and monks. And observe, Nikita Stethotos tells us, the equality and similarity in every respect between the two. While Nikita Stethotos, although he indeed mentions only a sacrifice of praise, describes it in terms familiar from an ecclesiastical liturgy. Quote, the unity of the powers on high, which sing praises, direct the hymns and conduct the choir, has a Trinitarian formation, and it stands before the Trinity in a Trinitarian manner, celebrating the liturgy and offering praises with fear. Close quote. Whereas theological and mystagogical texts may emphasize the spiritual aspect of heavenly worship, the surviving images seem to revel in the very materiality of Orthodox worship. We see angels carry vessels and veils, swing censers, reverence altars, and enact the various actions of priests, deacons, and minor clergy in the Byzantine rite. The texts may not push the parallelism to the extreme seen in the images, but they act as a springboard for the visual extension of this argument. This mirroring, or perhaps better, interchangeability of the earthly and heavenly actors in the liturgy, as articulated in monumental painting, is still more strikingly expressed in an embroidered textile, the iconostasis curtain from Kilindar Monastery on Mount Athos, embroidered in the year 1399. On this veil, Christ appears as a patriarch wearing a sakos, decorated with a pattern of crosses and roundels, over which he wears the bishop's stole or omophorion. Saints Basil and John Chrysostom, the authors of the two principal Byzantine Eucharistic liturgies, flank him. Both bishops wear the polystavrion philonion. Comparison with contemporaneous ceremonial manuals, or diataxis, of the patriarchal liturgy reveals that both the dress and the pose of the flanking bishop saints imitate those of the concelebrating bishops who would assist the patriarch at the altar. Angel deacons bearing liturgical fans stand behind the main figures. This textile would have hung within the central opening of the icon screen, shielding the altar from view. At the moment when the curtain was drawn aside for the presentation of the bread and wine at the great entrance and for their distribution at the communion, the human celebrant would be revealed standing at the altar table, exactly where the figure of Christ had been visible moments before. 
it would hardly be possible to articulate more clearly the paradigmatic role of Christ as high priest embodied in the figure of the actual celebrant of the liturgy. The very function of this object, a curtain shielding the sanctuary from view, evokes the veil of the tabernacle in the Sinai desert and later in the temple of Jerusalem. As we already mentioned, the author of the epistle to the Hebrews likens this veil to Christ's body, making an extended analogy between the rites of purification by which the temple priest enters the tabernacle through its veil and Christ's expiation for the sins of mankind by opening a way into heaven, quote, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Even without figural imagery, the sanctuary veil was already imbued with a significant theological charge through its very function. The embroidered decoration of the Kilandar curtain transforms it further into a kind of spiritual X-ray screen, both hiding the physical altar and clergy from view of the congregation and simultaneously making visible the spiritual reality of the celestial liturgy in which the earthly one partakes. Returning to the metaphor of the Matryoshka doll, I'd like to underscore the sameness of what the curtain conceals. The embroidered image of Christ and the hierarchs with angel deacons would have revealed behind them the similar, similarly vested clergy around the altar. This sameness, however, creates the danger of confusion of the likeness for the real thing. Thus, Simeon of Thessaloniki, in defending from Latin critique the practice of the veneration by the faithful of the elements of bread and wine carried in the great entrance procession prior to their consecration, insists that the unconsecrated elements work like an icon. Quote, if then we should attribute honor and reverence to sacred icons, so much more should we do so to the offered gifts themselves, which are antitypes, as Basil the Great says. It is fitting to prostrate oneself to the gifts being offered even before they become the body and blood of Christ and to the priests because of the divine vessels, even if some of them are empty, for that all of them partake of the sanctification of the divine gifts consecrated in them. And it is no cause for wonder that some are empty, for they carry these vessels in honor of the divine gifts, so that those watching and those approaching may all be holy. Here is where we begin to run into difficulties. For Simeon is applying the logic of the icon to the elements of bread and wine. If everything in the procession is holy by virtue of association with the sacrament, then what is the distinction between an empty vessel and one containing the actual Eucharistic bread. The sacramental nature of the Eucharist risks being lost in the shuffle. Indeed, veiling itself can become the object of veneration. In his famous and problematic book, Iconostas, Pavel Florensky builds on the Byzantine theology of the church to situate the iconostasis as one of a series of membranes that, like a firmament, mark divisions and points of contact between visible and invisible, physical and spiritual. Without this material boundary marker, which, as he says, makes the altar accessible to our consciousness by means of its unified rows of saints, the altar itself would be rendered invisible to the weakness of human perception. Quote, destroy the material iconostasis and the altar itself will, as such, wholly vanish from our consciousness as if covered over by an essentially impenetrable wall." Close quote. In other words, without the intervention of the pictorial screen between the altar and the people, the latter would be able to perceive nothing of the sacred action taking place there. Rather than having a merely pious function of concealing the holy, since after all, it is a common characteristic of holy mysteries to be hidden from profane view, screening itself seems to take over the very theological role of the sacrament as a mediator between physical and spiritual realms. In this conception of the imagery presented to the gaze of the faithful, the spiritual feeding from the reception of the Eucharist risks becoming an afterthought. Although Florevsky was himself canonically ordained uh, 
as a Russian Orthodox priest. One can see in his attitude towards the received tradition of veiling the mysteries, an echo of that espoused by certain sects of old believers, the priestless or Biespopovtsi. In the wake of the reforms of Patriarch Nikon in the 17th century, they preferred to go without priesthood or sacraments rather than compromise any detail of the church's tradition as they understood it. Their houses of worship retain the rows of icons that form a typical high iconostasis of the Russian type. But because they have no priesthood and thus no Eucharist and no altar, there is no sanctuary behind this screen. Rather, the icons are mounted directly to the east wall of the church, and if there are any doors in their iconostases, they go nowhere. As in the Presbyterian church of my childhood, there is only a blank wall. In a 1930 photo of the parish of priestless old believers in Vilnius, one can discern the central icon of the upper register of the iconostasis to be an image of the communion of the apostles. This uppermost position of the image makes it analogous to earlier images of the communion of the apostles that would have been visible just above the top of the sanctuary barrier as here at Staro Negorichani. But here in the old believer context, the icon of the sacrament has fully replaced the sacrament itself. Obviously, this is an extreme outgrowth of the tradition favored by a small minority, but it nonetheless illustrates from the point of view of the main lines of Byzantine sacramental theology, the potential danger of an over-literal liturgical realism. The veil itself becomes all and all. Thank you. Thank you, Warren, um, for that really stimulating talk. Um, so in 2023, King Charles III was anointed and crowned sovereign of the United Kingdom. As had been the case for his mother, Elizabeth II, Charles's anointing was kept from the camera's view. Yet in contrast to previous anointings, which had only employed a canopy and only partially blocked visual, visual access, the most recent royal anointing at Westminster Abbey included a new purpose-built screen commissioned to completely restrict the view of the anointing on all sides except that facing the altar. This essentially prohibited visual access to all those in attendance, including family members that were seated immediately adjacent to where the rite was unfolding. Now, Charles's anointing screen was embroidered with images intended to convey the deeper significance of the ritual gestures unfolding behind them. The central image on the screen was that of a dove representing the Holy Spirit as it hovers over a tree with 56 equal sized leaves symbolizing the family of the 56 nations in the Commonwealth. The screen in this way participated in a long history of liturgical veiling, like the highly developed traditions explored today by our speaker, Warren Woodfin. Prior to the coronation, the Yale ISM hosted a video discussion involving two of its liturgical studies faculty, Teresa Berger and Brian Sphinx, alongside one of its organists, James O'Donnell, who was the previous director of music at Westminster Abbey. In discussing the upcoming liturgy for the coronation, Brian Spinks expressed opposition to the use of an anointing screen, arguing that by not showing the anointing, the liturgy would inadvertently send the message that this portion of the rite was not the climax of the service. Rather, he argued, all the attention would go to the act of crowning, which would be visually, visually accessible. In contrast, O'Donnell pointed out that the act of veiling can actually highlight the importance of a particular liturgical gesture by setting it apart. And he pointed to the Byzantine iconostasis as a parallel example that simultaneously hides from view and seeks to reveal the deeper significance of the gestures being performed behind in the sanctuary that are not really accessible visual, visually from the nave. 
So in his paper today, Woodfin likewise discusses the relationship between, on the one hand, the liturgical action in the Byzantine rite, and on the other hand, the function of embroidered Byzantine liturgical textiles, which Woodfin argues are intended to uniquely guide the participant toward a deeper understanding of the sacramental mystery unfolding before them. His argument, it seems to me, centers on a theological idea embedded both in the Byzantine liturgical tradition and in the Bible. According to this view, God conceals himself in moments of his self-revelation. Woodwin discussed the Jewish tradition of the portable tabernacle and its fixed form as the Jerusalem temple. This was the axis mundi for ancient Israel the place of the most concentrated divine presence on earth. Yet the ark itself and its mercy seat, that is the very center of the temple in terms of its importance, were perpetually hidden behind not one, but two veils, which embroidered with images, each embroidered with images uh, that functioned as icons. They point to God's invisible presence and they simultaneously conceal it. Other biblical examples communicate this same theological vision, such as God's self-revelation self -revelation to Moses in the Sinai in the form of a burning bush, or even God's voice at the very beginning of Genesis that brings all creation, that is all sensory, sensory reality into being. In this latter case then, creation, like the burning bush, becomes an icon a vehicle for understanding the nature of God and his intentions for creating the universe. Woodwind then shows how this mystagogy continued in the Christian theological and liturgical uh, tradition. Here, however, the axis mundi has changed. It is no longer the Jerusalem temple, but Christ's body. Interestingly, Woodfin highlights the connection between the temple, Mary's role in weaving the curtains of the temple, as described in the Protoevangelium of James, and Mary's role in weaving the body of Christ in her womb. In this case, Mary and the temple curtains that Woodfin rightly connects to the later Byzantine textiles used to cover the Eucharistic gifts, give visible form to spiritual realities that would otherwise be invisible to the eye. This allows him to make an important art historical contribution, namely the proposal that Christ is holding a stamnos or urn rather than a chalice on the Beneke air. In other words, Christ is holding the Jerusalem temple urn with the manna, the bread of heaven given to the Israelites during their wandering in the Sinai desert and kept in the temple. I was particularly intrigued by these points Woodfin makes in his paper and by many others as well. As a historian of the liturgy, I found this, found his arguments quite compelling and I appreciated his embeddedness in Byzantine liturgical history, theology and mystagogical thought. So in order to invite our speaker to elaborate further upon his research in this domain, I will make some additional observations and give a question or two before inviting him to respond. So the first is rather a basic observation about the theological context of time. In your paper, you affirm that the Epitaphio simultaneously presents a liter liturgical now and an eschatological aspect that is both then and always. This is entirely convincing and has to do with the eschatological ori orientation of time in Byzantine liturgical practice. While the Eucharistic liturgy assumes a certain degree of linearity when, he, when its gestures are interpreted as reflecting Christ's birth, death, and resurrection, the liturgy also intentionally subverts this representation of a linear historical past. We find this expressed in the very liturgical texts that were used in the spaces of the churches you discuss in your paper. The most common example, of course, would be the text of the Anaphora of St. John Chrysostom, which by the later Byzantine period would have been the primary Eucharistic text of the Byzantine Christian world. As liturgical theologians have long noted, 
the anamnesis, that is to say, the act of memory making in this Eucharistic prayer makes sacramentally present the events in Christ's economy of salvation. And he does so by listing them in linear fashion. At the same time, the prayer also adds to that linear, linear chronology an event that has yet to occur, namely the second coming and the eschatological fulfillment or completion of historical time. In other words, the text of the anaphora showcases a theological context in which liturgical memory, too, is not simply a recollection of historical events that are no more. Rather, liturgical memory is not confined to the past nor to the present, but also participates in the future. This is a liturgical milieu that the artists you are dealing with were not only comfortable with, but as you show, seem to also be creatively contributing to. Now, tied to this is your discussion of the Belgrade Epitaphios, which I found very fruitful. I'd like to add one related example of slippage found in Byzantine liturgical manuscripts that very closely aligns with your reading of the artistic evidence. In the received Byzantine tradition, the priest prepares the bread and wine before the start of the liturgy in a rite known as the prothesis. As you know, at the end of this rite, the priest covers the chalice and the discos with individual veils and then places a large veil on top of them. The verses that he recites are today drawn from Psalm 93. The Lord is king, he is robed in majesty, the Lord is robed, he is girded with strength. These verses obviously connect the soon-to-be-consecrated Eucharistic gifts of bread and wine with Christ, the Lord. But interestingly, several Ephologian manuscripts from the medieval world written actually in several different languages, so in Georgian, Arabic, Slavonic, and Greek, actually uses these exact same psalm verses for the vesting of the priest as he puts on his individual vestments. Now, this makes a lot of sense, given the words of that psalm about the Lord vesting and being robed. This overlap in verses for two different ritual gestures stems from a perceived theological relationship between the vesting of the priest and the covering of the gifts. The covering of the gifts and the dressing of the priest are both acts of vesting, earthly, material agents of the Eucharist, namely the vesting of the gifts that will later be consecrated in anaphora into the body and blood of Christ, and the vesting of the priest or bishop who will lead the assembled church as Christ in consecrating the gifts in the anaphora. So put differently, the chalice and the discos will come to hold the body of Christ, just as the celebrant acts in the person of Christ, that is to say, he participates in Christ's priesthood as a dependent uh, of his bishop. So I would love to hear your thoughts on this ritual connection between freely interchanging the texts intended for the priests vesting and the gifts vesting, and also how you would make sense of the liturgical evidence from the perspective of our history, and whether we might think of the veils for the vessels more like vestments of Christ, including infant, adult, and both collapsed. Finally, I'm curious whether you think the mystagogical texts are the main conduit for the development of those images that collapse, for example, nativity and passion narratives, or whether the liturgy itself is also at some point a conduit. Regarding both the melismos, frescoes, and some of the textile images used upon liturgical vessels, what comes to my mind as a liturgical historian is the way the prothesis rite both adopts and rejects linear recollection of Christ's life. As you know, this rite for preparing the bread and wine underwent considerable development in middle and late Byzantine periods. And while the priest recites a number of verses related to Christ's passion throughout prepar preparing of bread and, and the chalice, some manuscripts copied in the Balkan region in the 13th and 14th century start to incorporate nativity symbolism into the prothesis as well, whereby the discos 
is essentially commemorated as the manger. For example, we see the introduction of verses from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, for when the priest covers the discos at the end of the prothesis rite with the asterisk. Now, this Matthean verse refers to the wise men seeing the star remain over the manger where Christ was lain. So in this case, the asterisk is the star and the discos is the manger. Interestingly, several South Slavic liturgical texts from this same period and region of some of the images that you discuss actually use an otherwise unattested Slavonic word for the asterisk. They refer to it as a sienica, which translates literally as a haloft. So in this case, the asterisk is not a star, but its sides represent the walls of a hay structure protecting the major, that is, the discos below it. These same manuscripts likewise include the develop, develop passion symbolism of the prothesis alongside these infant uh, symbols. So of course, mystagogical texts collapse the nativity and passion symbolism much earlier, even the Historia Ecclesiastica, which if we accept Sheltov's recently proposed dating was first written not by Germanos, but by an unknown author between the mid seventh and mid eighth century, already associates the entirety of the sanctuary space with Bethlehem and Christ's nativity, despite being the prothesis, seeing the prothesis principally as a reenactment of Christ's death. By the 11th century, the prothesis and the manger where Christ was laid down after his birth are explicitly connected in the mystagogical treatise known as the Proteria. So, and without getting into chicken or the egg dynamic, I would also be curious to hear your thoughts on the interplay and three-way dialogue between image, ritual practice, and mystagogy. Well, thank you so much, Nina, for these um, rich um, comments. And I'm so glad that this is being recorded so that I can go back and take uh, more careful notes um, listening to you a second time. Um, but uh, where to start? Um, I, I love your um, analogy with the coronation of of King Charles and the uh, and the embroidered screen behind which um, the anointing takes place. And of course, this this um, divergent way of seeing the um, hiddenness. Like, does it um, draw focus away from what is hidden or does it rather highlight um, exactly the things that we cannot see? And um, so the, the paradox that I'm trying to draw out here is on the one hand, the efficacy of embroidered imagery on veils and thinking of veils very broadly to include, of course, the um, the iconostasis itself as a, a a tangible form of veiling um and i think you're absolutely right to include liturgical vestments in there i'll come back to that in a moment um but the also the problem that it that the veils themselves can become um the center of attention rather than um the thing they are hiding. So um, as far as your um, specific slippages, I love the um, the Psalm 93 used as a vesting prayer. And I think that makes absolute sense. Um, I remember being raked over the coals by a certain reviewer, not you, of my um, of my book on liturgical vestments for um for using the term liturgical vestments as opposed to distinguishing between the hieratic vestments and the liturgical vestments as different categories, as is you know very frequently done in in modern Greek writing, um, I of course was only dealing with the clothing of the clergy in that book, but I really think it's one category, uh, and the covering of the the discos and the chalice and uh, the covering of the clergy are all performing the same kind of function. They're all um, revealing 
in a tangible way what is invisible to um, the eye except through um, mystagogical contemplation. Um, now, there, you've, you've raised um, a couple of, of really interesting questions about where the imagery is coming from. Uh, one thing I would just like to note, because this has been a bee in my bonnet for a while, um, I've got kind of gotten um, off on a tangent with looking at phonetic spellings in inscriptions as evidence that artists are actually coming up with things on their own. And I noticed um, the words of institution on the Potiro Kalima from the Benaki are actually misspelled. Mm -hmm. And they have an eta for an, where there should be an upsilon, which uh, in imi, uh, um, imin, right? Um, which is semantically, you know, important. That's a semantically important um, spelling, mm -hmm. uh, but it's been spelled phonetically. And not correctly, uh, which gives you the sense that the artist has not necessarily been given a slip of paper by a priest to um, depict this this way, and here's your inscription, uh, but rather is through experience of the liturgy is coming up with this kind of imagery. So um, that I think is itself an interesting testimonial to how pervasive um, this kind of imagery is and this kind of thinking that it's not just happening at the level of our Nikita Stathatas or our Simeon of Thessaloniki, that this is filtering down to our functionally literate but not perfect speller um, embroiderers who are you know, coming up with this kind of iconography. Um, not in a vacuum, certainly, but also not having it dictated to them um, model book style. Um, I'd never known about the hayloft <laughs> or the asterisk. That's fantastic. Uh, that's really... And so far, I've only found it in South Slavic manuscripts. Uh -huh. And it disappears as soon as the books are standardized in the later 14th century. Nice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so about slippages. Um, this is something I think that they're aware of. And so often, um, images work chiastically. Um, that you you always have this sort of near approach, but it's never quite the um, quite as on the nose as one might expect until it is on the nose, and then when it is, it's a little like you know. One thing I, I struggle with is figuring out okay, why is the image of the Christ child popping out of the chalice so disturbing? And is it just that, you know, we all had jack-in-the-box toys as children and it's too much like a jack-in-the-box? Or is there something actually a little unsettling about that degree of um, literalness in depicting, you know, the real presence in the wine? Um, but in I general, I'm going to direct it just for a second. Um, so I was, you know, not being an art historian, I'm going to depend on you to fulfill in some of the missing, um, data right now, but I was particularly struck with the Gracchanica image of Christ, mm -hmm. um, in part because the Christ child, um, looks like an like a young young boy as opposed to a baby and i realize that often would you like me to are... share that again I can, uh, can you hear me are you hearing me yeah i can hear you yeah so pulling up the image okay um so 
what struck me about this image um, is that the Christ child looks a bit like a boy to me. And I realize that in depictions of the infant child are sometimes much more, much more mature looking child um, than an infant. But I am wondering if perhaps this might also be a, a visual reference to the arrested sacrifice of Isaac. Hmm, that's really interesting. Um, now, I hadn't thought of that. Um, what I had thought of in terms of some of these images of a, a boy Jesus as opposed to a, you know an infant is the idea that the Christ Emmanuel type tends to be an image of sort of the logos out of time. And if I can figure out how to search effectively in the thesaurus linguae greca for references to the hidden um, childhood of, of Christ and trying to think about, all right, why is the Emmanuel image used this way? But um, but it does seem to me that there's a pattern there that um, that so often um, the um, the neither baby nor um, nor yet adolescent Christ is the one who is shown um, in this state. So it's a kind of um, getting back again to your um, thoughts about liturgical time um, that this is you know neither. The infant nor the adult we're we're sort of uh dealing with a, a cosmic eternity as opposed to um something that we can pinpoint neatly in the uh in the um chronology of salvation history um well on that note um i do want to ask you um what you think is the difference then um, between this tendency to reveal and conceal simultaneously within the ancient Jewish framework and then within the Byzantine Christian framework, right? And so I see the sort of obvious connections with Christ's, Christ's body, the chalice, Eucharist, you know, a heavenly liturgy, I mean, liturgy itself, that's, you know, obviously, the, the, that's, that's just the obvious connections. But I'm wondering what sort of fundamentally, what evidence might there be in Byzantine visual material that suggests a concrete shift in, in how the humanity is able to perceive divinity once that divinity has sort of incarnated incarnated itself in a physical body, right? Yes. We're still well, concealing, we're still hiding and revealing, right? But is the, are we doing it differently now, right? I think so. And I think, I think the, um, the uh, and this is, you know, some fairly unformed thoughts on my part, but the God of Israel is hidden um, in a way that is permanent and absolute behind uh, the, the veils of the temple. And in fact, of course, in the second temple, there is even no, no ark. It's simply um, an empty space and the name of God pronounced by the priest on uh, Yom Kippur is the divine presence um, is the, the, the most tangible form of the divine presence. Um, whereas, of course, in Christianity, you're dealing with a sacrament that is in a real sense. And <laughs> the Catholic Church obviously has a, a slightly more uh, firmly nailed down sense of how that is how that real works, but in a real sense, the body and blood of Christ. And it is perceptible. Um, it is taste tasted and um and touched and gives shape to the veils that cover it. Um, so it's ultimately seeable. 
it's just the the degree to which um these veils um take on a greater and greater role i would say over the the course of the period we're talking about you know from um, really starting with the 11th century and you know going up to the 15th um they take on a greater and greater role so that um in a sense what is tangible and visible is still there but the the revelation of it is is smaller and um and smaller Anastasia Verandaki gave a talk a year ago in this series, and she was um, on the Epitaphios recently acquired and restored in the Benaki Museum, and she made a reference to the Prokipsis ceremony um, and the, you know, the revelation of the emperor from behind a set of parted curtains. And it's not a bad analogy uh, that the drama of the liturgical right is is here heightened by restricting more and more the moment of view and of course the chalice is ultimately shown um unveiled um at the um moment when the the people are invited to communion um so there is always that unveiled yeah. showing um in a way that you know that never happened um, with the holy invisible God of the um, of the Jewish temple, right. um, and of course the images. There's something rather different between you know the image of uh, the Belgrade Apotavius that has stars on it, but also has the body of Christ uh, from the outer veil of the temple, which has the constellations on it, but no human figures. Of course. Um, another question I had, um, sort of switching gears a little bit, but I was curious about the extent to which the individual viewer's visual perspective impacts their and our reading of the images. And so what I mean here is laity were, are only seeing, um, like in some, in some specific cases, are only seeing the celestial, the celestial liturgy, right? Um, mm -hmm. but clergy, you know, on the other side of the icon screen are seeing the earthly liturgy on the altar as well as the celestial liturgy or this depiction of the liturgy above them. So how might that sort of impact our reading of the meaning is sort of in some ways intended uh, by these images? Oh, I mean, absolutely. It, it's a huge um, issue. And I, I, you know that that image from um, Steno Negrochane um, is such a useful one because it shows what's so often true that the, the communion of the apostles appears just above the icon screen when you're standing um, at least fairly far back in the naos, and many of these images, like the Melismos at uh, Kerbinovo, would really only be visible to the clergy who would be looking at it across the altar, which is only a few feet away from it. Um, so it becomes a much more direct kind of commentary on what they are doing um, at the altar. So yes, I think we're looking at a series of related messages that are functioning somewhat differently for different audiences, because obviously you can't, you know, you can't see all of these at the same time. And the Eucharistic veils are going to pass by the view of the laity in the naos, but not necessarily be subject to close scrutiny in the way that clergy handling them at the altar or in the parathesis would have, you know, close access to them and see the imagery and be able to read the inscriptions. So right. I think that physical context is is extremely important. Yeah, and I, I love how you bring in the ritual visuality as well, because it really shifts everything, right, in terms of how it's being experienced. But 
I guess I'm wondering also in connection to some of the problems that can arise with this imagery that you were describing. And um, so, and also what is kind of the intention of the iconographic program? in terms of its conception of this, what we sometimes refer to as the communion of the apostles, mm -hmm. right? So if if a lay person in the nave is looking at that and only seeing that for most of the liturgical service, right? Their primary referent becomes that, especially in times of sort of reflection, right? Um, uh, if you're a priest, you are seeing it very differently. So your relationship to the heavenly kingdom being depicted above is going to actually always include the earthly reality in front of you, right? Yes. And so I'm wondering in terms of like theological problems that can arise when a late, the lady are only seeing a part of the picture. Right. And I think it, it very easily becomes, you know, if this is what you are seeing above the liturgy that's unfolding at the altar, right. hidden to some degree or another from view, uh, then that um, communion of the apostles or um, celestial liturgy becomes, in a sense, more vivid. Um, there is the danger. I, I thought about opening this paper instead of the anecdote about the church of my upbringing. Um, uh, production of West Side Story I saw right before COVID, um, this Ivan Benhove production. Um, and there was a New York Times sort of um, unfavorable review that called it Sharks versus Jets versus Video because the actors on stage were so overwhelmed by the video projections. And there were a number of scenes that were taking place like in a bodega on stage and you couldn't actually see the actors in the shop except on this giant video projection. So there's an analogy here, right? That obviously, you know, Byzantine mosaic and video are not quite the same, but they're both um, bright um, eye-catching media. And so seeing, you know, Christ distributing communion to the apostles uh, over um, the actual unfolding liturgy does run the risk of, of drawing focus away from what's actually happening um, in the right. And um, is that a problem, right? I mean, obviously, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm conceiving of, of it as a problem. I'm, I think that's a, a question that bears questioning um right is what's the what's the danger here um well i mean i think the danger is that the the liturgy as a vessel for the communication of sacredness like becomes its own um idol right, right. but there's um you know there's my my inner Protestant coming out. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, Wash that. <laughs> uh, that was uh, truly a wonderful paper and a uh, very interesting and informative uh, discussion. We are grateful to uh, both of you. Our next lecture will take place on April 12th at the same time. It's going to be the last uh, lecture in the series for this academic year. And it's titled At Home with Festia, Women, Wealth, and the Late Antique Household, and will be given by uh, Betsy Williams from Dumbarton Oaks. Uh, we hope to see you all then, um, and uh, good afternoon.